Our guest in this segment is Delegate Elias Coop Gonzalez. Coop, good morning to you, man. Good morning. Thanks for having me. It's good to be back. It's been a while. What brought you to the Eastern Panhandle this weekend? Well, I'm just uh, here visiting friends. Uh, sometimes I, I like to do errands in D.C., uh, dry cleaning, stuff like that. Um, but my friend Lala told me that uh, Lala there was, Mooney. A, yeah, there was a, a spot available at 9, and yeah, I wanted to come on. I got a uh, an email from Lala over the weekend that said, Rob Elias is in town, and uh, he would like to come on the show. Uh, do you have a spot for him? Elias, uh, um, I don't know if you know this, but Lala works part-time for me as a talk show promoter and booker. I don't pay her, but she, she puts in a lot of hours getting me guests. And Lala, thank you. We love you. Uh, so anyway, we had you on uh, right after the president's debate, and you were the person on the Republican side, and Sam Petsonk was on the Democratic side. Uh, but uh, we didn't really get a chance to talk to you about West Virginia policy at that time. It was more of a critique mm -hmm. of the president's uh, performance, and uh, you were both on the Trump and the Biden side. So first and foremost, uh, you were one of the youngest delegates to ever be elected in the state. What age were you when you decided to run for office? Mm. Well, I was 19 uh, when I filed, and then I turned 20 right before the primary. I got elected, became the nominee, and uh, then in the general, I I got elected at 20. And what yeah. district do you represent? I, rep I represent the 67th district, which is Randolph and Pendleton counties. All right. And how did how did you wind up in Randolph and Pendleton counties? Well, it's kind of a long story, but uh, I guess just to condense it, um, I was born in Guatemala to an American dad and uh, a Guatemalan mom. And I think that's actually kind of given me a unique perspective on American politics. It's really influenced me, it really made me grateful to be an American. But uh, I was raised there until I was 12, so I came here in, in 2014. And as it stands, I've, I've lived about 60% of my life outside of the United States. And I went to California, lived there with, with my dad for a while. My, my mom and dad, they separated. I decided to go with my dad. It wasn't an, an easy decision, but for me, it was very clear what I wanted to do, You know, the, the choice of uh, staying down there, being in the United States. Uh, who's going to turn down You know, going, going to the United States? And, and being a citizen, I had that right. So I spent a year in, in California, <clears throat> excuse me, and we just, we found out how quickly, how expensive everything is in California and how, how difficult it is to live there. And so my dad, he's always had this uh, kind of love for West Virginia, even though he hadn't, he hadn't been there very many times. And he'd always talked about it, just like, hey, you know, why don't we just move to West Virginia? And he actually went through with it. We, we went to West Virginia, I think. The first time I came here was when I moved here. So I was like, you know, this is it. And uh, at first, I, you know, I didn't really know what to expect. But I just got immersed in the culture and the people, and I fell in love with it. I've been here ever since. You know, I've, I've left a little bit for school, for internships, things like that. But um, my plan is to stay here, and, yeah, hopefully I can do that. What do you do as a day job other than being a delegate? Coop? Right now I'm still in college, finishing my, my undergrad. And where are you um, going to school? I'm going to Liberty University. Yeah. All right, very good. And I can also safely say the three of us in this room are terribly envious of your hair. You have great hair, too. <laughs> Thank you. And Dylan, so I'm going to throw Dylan in the mix, too. We're all en envious of Coop's hair, man. Just beautiful quaff. Thank you. Thank you. That's definitely my Guatemalan jeans. Got good hair. <laughs> hey, I uh, want to talk to you first about the uh, governor's tax cut proposal. We'd like to add another 5% uh, personal income tax onto what the triggering mechanism seems to indicate would be a 3 or 4% mm -hmm. uh, tax cut. As a delegate, your thoughts on whether or not the state should go through with this? Yeah. I mean, any time that we can do that, I think that would be beneficial. One good thing that we did this past session is we, uh, we pushed forward even further the uh, tax relief on Social Security, you know, just to get rid of it completely. That's a very important thing, uh, especially since a lot of people who are, are older on, are on fixed incomes so the money that they get, that's it. You know, they're not going to go out and make more money or get overtime or whatever. Um, but another thing that's really important is we need to give tax relief to the people who are uh, the working class, right? Uh, people who are earning the money and who are who are at the tax base. And the personal income tax would be the the best way to to reward them. And pretty much everywhere that that is cut the income tax or even removed it altogether, we've seen phenomenal economic growth. I mean, a lot of a lot of people uh, moving there. And it is a, a tax that more or less favors young people. It's, it's those people that are, you know, 30s, 40s, uh, earning a lot of money. 
and I, I think that can help incentivize them to come to the state. So are, you that's a good thing. are you concerned at all uh, about removing revenue in chunks like this? Mm -hmm. uh, because the next year, you don't know what your expenses might be. And we do know that there are some expenses that continue to increase, like PEIA, for instance. Mm -hmm. And there is a need in the state for funding for many of the social services that some claim are underfunded mm -hmm. in West Virginia. Cool. Well, actually, I think that the state government is very bloated. <laughs> Um, when you look at, at West Virginia in the past few years, we've actually grown a little bit. Um, but when you look at the past about 10 years that Republicans have been in charge, we've still decreased in population a little bit. So that means that if you keep the the budget flat, you know, subject to inflation, right, flat considering inflation, that means you're still growing the size of government relative to the population, right, because the, the size of government staying constant, you're losing population. Well, this past year, we actually grew the size of government to the tune of about $200 million. So we're, we're actually increasing the size of government while, as you know, during the entire time the Republicans have been in charge, we've lost people. And I don't think that's a good thing. I, I think there's a lot of different programs that uh, could be made more efficient and are wasting a lot of money right now. Uh, I could go into a lot of different directions with that, but where I would start is with the Department of Economic Development, which in my opinion is just a really big slush fund for politicians to make friends with. Uh, corporations and and give them uh, essentially handouts and I think there's almost a billion dollars what's the purpose of the handouts well the purpose of the handouts is supposedly economic development uh, but I think there's a, a series of issues with that I think one from a philosophical perspective I just don't think that the government should be giving away money to businesses right I think business that should be a, a, a private thing Excuse me just a second. Mm -hmm. But without that, we would not have had Mesa's in Berkeley County. We would not have had Procter & Gamble in Berkeley County. We probably would not have had Quad Graphics in Berkeley County going back a few years ago. Isn't there a a, a benefit from these, as you call, handouts? Mm -hmm. I think you could see a, a short-term benefit. But if you actually look at the economics of it, when you're taking money away from taxpayers of the state, Right, people who are you know cashiers or restaurant owners, um, from people like that, you're taking away money from uh, lower class, poor people, and middle class people, and essentially giving it to companies that are w very wealthy to build plants. And generally, what the reasoning is is, well, you know, some of these people t pay income taxes, and and it'll generate a little bit of revenue for the state. But if you look at Form Energy, for example, we gave about 300, or we're we're going to give them about 300 million dollars. That's what the contract is. And in order to get that much money back from, you know, the taxes that they pay, I mean, it would take so much time, it, it's not even practical. But you're using one example, but I gave four or five, and I can probably give another 15 to 20 mm -hmm. examples where there's been an economic benefit yeah. to, these, to the state. So I'll, I'll summarize it this way. I believe that the economic benefit of just giving a tax cut that would benefit all businesses in the state would be more economically beneficial than taking that money and giving it to one corporation to build one plant in one county. I think long term it would be better just to take that money, give tax cuts to everybody, and then have those businesses move here. But that was part of our amendment two, which failed. Yeah. Well, uh, amendment two failed for a, a few different reasons. Um, I know some people had issues with the way that it was written. You know, the state could have taken away from, uh, money from the counties and, and just redistributed in different ways. I was kind of conflicted about that. I would like to see um, later down the road something like Amendment 2, but without all the issues that, that came with it and with the benefits. John Gilstra, <clears throat> I project back, I was a little bit older than you, I guess. I was, I was in my early 30s, young family. I had the opportunity to have a dream job. Actually, it was the extension. I had to, in order to stay with my dream job, I would have had to go to East Camden, Arkansas. And the reason I didn't go to East Camden, Arkansas, was that the schools were bad. They had the taxes were great. In, it was going from Virginia, mm -hmm. so the taxes would have been a lot less. But the schools were terrible. The infrastructure, the roads weren't good. They had a lot of hunting and fishing, which is not kind of my thing. And so I left that dream position because of 
the fact that I was going to an area with bad schools and I had I had a, a young boy that, that I wanted to have mm. a good education. So it seems to me that the that the perceived nexus between low or zero income tax, state income tax, and people flooding to a state, I, I don't I don't I don't perceive that as real. Mm. Where we see it in Florida well, of course, because Florida has Disney World and you know all those entertainment things. Tennessee has all those entertainment places. Texas has all those entertainment places. And we don't have that. Mm -hmm. So when we cut the taxes, do you really think we're going to see and, – and when we don't, we don't have the improvement in the schools, we don't mm -hmm. have the improvement in the infrastructure, do you really think we're going to see a lot of people leaving their northern Virginia and, and suburban Maryland jobs and coming out into rural West Virginia? I do, and I think a, a big reason why we don't have a lot of those things is just because we don't have a tax structure like, like those states do. Yeah. Have you looked at the demographics of this? You, you alluded to the fact that if we cut income tax, we'd keep more of the young folks into the, uh, uh, in, in the state. The flip side is you'd be bringing a lot more retirees mm -hmm. into the state. Some retirees pay for their, their benefits. Others are not cannot do that they're not financially stable uh, uh, financially stable to do it so isn't there shouldn't you look at the demographics and and slice that pie into various pieces and see how it all comes out well as, as I previously mentioned uh, we did do a very important thing by essentially furthering the relief of people who are on, on social security income right uh, eliminating it altogether earlier and that's that's where the as you said, the different uh, slices of the pie comes in, right? We're, we're making sure that we're taking care of our vulnerable seniors first, making sure that they, they are able to take advantage of every penny that they earned throughout their lives, right, that they put into the fund. But now I think we need to focus on those younger people who want some tax relief and want to be able to enjoy the, the fruits of their labor. I guess my point is uh, cutting the taxes. Would it benefit the younger folks more or would it benefit the older folks more by bringing more older, mm -hmm. older folks into the, into the state? That really depends. When it comes to the income tax specifically, I think that will incentivize younger people more uh, because uh, you see people who are in their 30s and 40s, they're, they're earning uh, uh, more money than the rest of the population. Of course, the, the older population has the most money, but they're retired. They're, you know, they've got all the money saved up and everything. Uh, when you look at Amendment 2, you look at tax breaks on machinery, things like that, that will incentivize more capital in the state. It, it really depends what approach you take, which taxes you want to cut uh, as to who, who it will incentivize. That's why I think the personal income tax would be a good one because uh, we, we just need more younger people in our state. If, if you have a lot of old people um, and not a lot of young people, that means that those younger people that are paying into the system, um, there won't be enough of them to support the, the social programs that help out our seniors and our kids and all that. So that's a serious problem we need to fix. Well, it's a good time to be yeah. aggressive with uh, state personal income tax because you can work anywhere you want now. So many people work remotely, it really doesn't matter where you live. So you can move to any part of the country you want to, take advantage of a better tax status, and it really doesn't affect how you get to work. It's a different time now. Uh, Coop, I want to ask you about child care. Younger mm -hmm. people come to the state. And uh, one thing you can't avoid it uh, is the expense of child care in many circumstances. I had to pay it at one point. It's almost like leasing two really nice cars at the same time. Uh, it's an expense. The governor has proposed some child care tax credits in the state. Your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. I think when we look at the, the child care issue, we need to understand that there is a problem that's, that's trying to be fixed, but we need to determine whether the government is really uh, – the solution for this problem because there's a lot of unintended consequences uh, that could arise from this and we've seen this from research where this has been Im implemented so child care in general in my opinion based on on the research that's out there is not ideal for kids uh, in those really early years from from the time that they're born to the time that they're around four or five those are the years that are going to pretty much dictate the rest of their life about how their personality is going to be uh, you can determine from from how those kids are behaving at those ages whether they're going to have good grades or not or they're going to get into crime pretty reliably it, it's pretty incredible um, and so when you take a a child that's uh, traditionally you know for for the past several generations since the founding of our country traditionally just been taken care of mostly by their mom at home 
they get more individualized special attention and affection and that's going to be more effective than leaving them in a, a much bigger environment with a lot of kids and be, being taken care of by you know just some employees and I think just general just common knowledge or wisdom would suggest that but there's also data behind it there's also I, that's also the preference of the parents there was there was a study done by the uh, Institute for Education Sciences that found that over 70 percent of parents actually prefer for you know themselves to take care of their kids uh, for when the kids are around the you know uh, when they're born to around the time that they're about five and I think the the long-term effects uh, could be negative on the kids because uh, the data also shows that uh, I, I think it was a it was a study published by the University of Chicago very recently it was based on on uh, the Universal Child Care Program Institute in Canada about 20 years ago now we're starting to see the the results from it and and they found that kids that uh, went to these programs as opposed to kids that were given the in, in individualized special attention from their parents they suffer more from hyperaggression depression um, they, they have lower uh, grades in school they've got all, all these other types of problems and so when we as a state see this problem uh, I think the, the problem that they're, they're trying to address mostly, it, it's a number of, of issues, but the, the, the main issue that they're trying to fix is the labor issue. Um, one of the things that I heard down in Charleston is, well, we need to expand the labor force. And I think that we should be very, very careful before we move forward and it's essentially incentivize mothers to not be with their kids just so you know some corporations can benefit from some extra labor. Coop, I, I don't think most people use daycare because they want to. Mm -hmm. They use it because they have to. So I, in terms of incentivizing mothers to not take care of their kids, you have a kid, you got to go back to work. What do you do with the kid? If, you know, you, maybe your parents aren't around or they can't watch the kid because they're still working or grandparents or whatever. There's just no way to do it other than you going to work and paying bills and you need someone to take care for the kid. Mm -hmm. I think that's more the, the more uh, common scenario there. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? That's the yeah. question. The governor's way of dealing it is by saying, "Okay, we know you got to get to work, and you know you got to pay for your kid. Here's a little break on the child care expenses. You can deduct some of them." Mm -hmm. Well, and again, I think that that choice should be left up to the the parents ultimately. And I understand that sometimes uh, parents have to make decisions like that, right? To make ends sure. meet, and and that's totally understandable. But I think for the government to step in, essentially creating incentives for that, that could have long-term consequences. Is anyone suggesting that the parents don't make that choice? Well, they're, they're still going to be making the choice, but now we're going to create a structure with the government where that's, that's essentially what we're promoting. And I do believe that we should, I, you know, I'm, I'm fairly libertarian in, in my uh, economics, you know, when, when I'm in, in the legislature. I'm probably the most libertarian member of, of the West Virginia legislature, but I'm, I'm not quite a full libertarian. I'm a conservative. I believe that we should use the government to promote the family and, and support them. But I think the, the ideal that we should promote as the state government is a structure where you can have a nuclear family, a, a mom and a dad, and where the dad can earn enough money to support mom and the kids. And anything that we can do as the state to promote that structure is what we should pursue. And I think that... But you just said you were against incentives given to corporations to move into the state. And these people bring high-paying mm -hmm. jobs like we're seeing with the steel plant out in Mason County. That was an inducement by you folks in the legislature to mm -hmm. get them to come to Mason County. You said you were against that, though. Well, I'm, I'm in favor of the government supporting families when it comes to picking losers of businesses. Mean? Well, it, it could mean a different. Uh, uh, it could mean different things. We could uh, just one, just one. Well, I think uh, we could look at child credits, things like that. I mean, uh, there's there's living expenses that are that uh, come with with having kids. But what I'm what I'm cautious about is specifically the child care aspect. Um, I think from a, a more general perspective, I mean, just lowering costs. That's a really pro family thing. Um, you know, being pro energy, uh, you know, groceries are, are through the roof right now. Of course, a lot of those uh, effects are from the federal government. Things that's happening there, but again, I think ultimately, what the state should promote and the structure that we should try and, and uh, 
uh, protect is is the family. And I think any time that we tinker with that and we create incentives that just disband families, that's a bad thing. And and you know you might have some some short term e economic growth at first, but I think the long term consequences. Um, are, are much worse and far outweigh the, the short-term economic benefits. I don't think anybody is going to use child care more because they're getting a tax credit for it, Coop. I think, if anything, that's going to allow them to be able to afford it more. They're paying it one way or the other. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of whether they're living the rest of their life on credit cards or whether sure. they can actually afford to buy stuff without running themselves into debt because of their child care Well, costs. and you hear this, there are many, many stories. Um, well, don't tell a long one because I've only got 60 seconds. Well, I mean, the people who cannot go to work because they can't, there's no, they, they can't afford child care. So therefore, they just stay home on welfare. In which case, the and, government's and, paying them to stay In which case, home. the government's paying them to stay home. That's, how is that good? So which is the but, lesser of the evils? Right. It's an interesting dilemma there. Yeah. Coop, thanks for coming mm -hmm. in, man. What are, you, what are you doing the rest of the day? Thanks for having me. Well, I just finished my summer classes. Uh, I had to take uh, a semester off because of session, so I had to catch up on those. So I'm just resting for now. Uh, maybe go to Chipotle later on. <laughs> nice. That sounds like a plan. You taking Lala with you? Uh, well, that's a good idea, actually. Yeah. I'll, maybe I'll give her a call. Tell her I said hello. Thank you. Elias Coop Gonzalez, uh, delegate at uh, 931.